okay if you click on any one of these keys you'll see some options that you can assign to the uh, to the key some of these don't make sense to uh, add to a key because there's already a physical button on the phone for example like the access voicemail uh, or do not disturb but you can create a uh, other key such as uh, speed dial um, you can do a watch extension uh, a watch extension is basically where you're going to see the status of this uh, other extension, extent, for example, like extension 103. If the phone in beside it, you can put the users, um, so you get the extension 103. Some phones will give you the opportunity to actually write the uh, the name of the person. All right, so you can also, this is a watch extension, so whenever that person goes uh, off hook, they make a call, you're going to see that status. <coughs> um, you can also... Uh, the key will blink when they're receiving a call on that extension 103. You can place a call to that extension 103 by pressing that uh, that key as well. As you begin adding new extensions, new options, new features on this, the system, you'll be you'll see this list continue to grow. For example, I can assign a call park extension for for parking calls. Uh, that's important. You're definitely going to need those. I can create a, sh uh, a shared voicemail box on, uh, for example, for example, uh, for example, like one extension 120 or extension 250. Those are designated as shared voicemail boxes or general voicemail boxes, where I could see these. Uh, if somebody calls in, they leave a, uh, a voicemail in that general voicemail box. I would see the status of that uh, general voicemail box on the uh, on this particular key. And then I could assign, for example, like uh, schedules, so I can see when certain schedules are active for like time and uh, like night service and time of day routing. You can see when that schedule is active, and you can even change that schedule. All right. So if I were to press save. It asks me, do you want to reboot the phone? And I say yes. Okay, at that point, the phone um, will begin to reboot, which it is. And the reason it needs to reboot is because it needs the changes that I just made are all not only known uh, by the system. The phone doesn't get those changes until it gets a new configuration file. So it has to reboot request a new configuration file, and at that point it will see the new changes. All right, the, um, let's look at the templates. So definitely some time savers here. You, uh, you don't have to go out and configure all the, 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 uh, the devices manually. Um, the templates you can see that there's a, a default template, and then there's a, you can create new templates. I created one. I called it custom template. All right. And once I've created that template name, I can click on it, and I can go to. Uh, you'll see a list of all the different vendors on the left-hand side. I can click on any one of these. For example, Snum. And then there's a, a drop-down list of all the different phone models. And there's a uh, one at the top for the, the, the general settings. All right, the, uh, if you're configuring some phones, first thing you're going to want to, this is, uh, on this page, you're going to find settings and parameters that are taken directly out of their configuration file. All right, so uh, these are settings that we have either modified and we put them on this page to let you change them back. Or there are possible settings that, that um, people have come to us and say that you know they're finding a need to change a particular option or setting or something like that. So we put it here on this page to allow, allow you to change it to your preference or the customer's preference. And, um, and that's the setting that we're going to use when we create the uh, configuration files all right again these are taken directly word for word um, and the options are directly from their uh, the phone's uh, configuration settings uh, file
Okay, uh, so the first one, if, if you're configuring a SNOM phone, you definitely want to change the first one. This is the format for your caller ID. By default, it's only going to show the name. You probably want the caller, uh, the caller ID to show the name followed by the number or the number followed by the name. So you, you change that setting and you'll save it. And then, um, you know, for the SNOM phones, you're going to have that particular option. All right, there's, um, there's also settings for the different phone models. Okay, so for example, like the, uh, the 7 SNOM 760s, you've got a template here. If you know that on every key 16, you're going to configure a uh, watch extension 103, and you know that's going to be somebody's name, whoever's name that is. All right, so I can do that for all the phones. Uh, anytime you configure a, a SNOM 760, it would have that key 16 assigned as a watch extension 103. All right, um, after you create the template and change any of the different uh, phones, vendors, uh, you can go back to your IP line settings, and now you need to set that as the default template. This is there's going to be a primary one that'll be used as a default for all phones. If you created other templates, you'd have to change those individually on the uh, each IP line. All right, so you can see that each phone model created or each uh, phone provisioned is going to use that uh, particular template. If I wanted this extension 107, if it had a uh, another template, um, I can create a, a template just for another group of phones, for example. <coughs> All right, excuse me. All right, the. Um, Let's take a look at the uh, the phone. Uh, you can also there's a place where you can upload the phone logos for certain phone models. They tell you how to how to do that. They have to be a um, a certain size and, uh, and format. So it mentions how to do all that. All right. So that's uh, that's good for configuring the phones. Let's uh, let's go take a look at our, our logs. Let's see what happens when that phone tries to uh, tries to register. Okay, so we're going to look at maintenance, and then system logs, and then click on system logs again, and you'll take you'll be taken to this page. It has certain log buffers, log file buffers here on the left hand side, and the one we're going to be looking at is the one in red called SIP registration. And let's see if we can see a, uh, a sequence. <clears throat> so this is a, a SIP message. And when the phone is, uh, when it boots up, it's going to send a, well, the, as I mentioned, the registration message to the PBX. All right, we can see that uh, that occurred here uh, a little, little bit ago. Um, this is the complete message, a register message. If you want to know which device is sending that message, just above the line above SIP message buffer start, it says that this message came from the IP 172.30.0.114 using port 5060 from that device, and it's being sent to the QX 172.30.0.1, that's our LAN IP port 5060. So the phone is using port 5060, and it's being sent to the QX port 5060. Those two do not need to match. Okay, a lot of times they, they do not. Uh, each device can have its own unique SIP port. If you change the SIP port on the QX to 5065, then this would be uh, be sent from the phone 5060 to the uh, QX port 5065. Okay. That's a misconception that's out there. The two devices do not need to have the same exact SIP port. Each one's going to have its own port that it will use. 
All right, the um, the SIP mes message will register. Um, it's trying to register to this local extension 106, that's the username, at the IP address of the QX. And it's coming from the, uh, the phone, username local extension 106, IP uh, 172.30.0.14, port 5060. This contact is where the QX needs to send any re replies to. Basically, when the system gets this register message, it will need to send any replies to this contact. All right. And it tells us the phone model. This is the T49G. Okay. And um, <clears throat> we're going to send back a, uh, a 401 unauthorized message. All right, and in response to that, the phone is going to send the same message again. This time it will have a username and a password in here, local extension 106, and it's going to have a password in it. And in this case, the registration was not accepted. The system replied again with an unauthorized message. So there's got to be something wrong with that phone. That was one of the, that phone T49 that I provisioned. Okay, um, it evidently, uh, I would probably do a factory default on that phone and let it get a new username and password. All right, let's see if, uh, so this sequence um, continues. Let me see if I can find a, uh, a successful registration here. The phone is going to continue to register over and over again until uh, at some point it's uh, it is successful. Let me go back in the logs here, a little ways, and let's see what a, a successful registration would look like. Let's see. I know when we registered the um, Snom phone, I know that one worked. Register. Okay, so here's a um, this was a register message that came from a uh, the SNOM 360. The system replied with an unauthorized message. Okay, uh, anytime the the system gets a a uh, a message from a device, we need to re respond to it, which we did with an unauthorized. In this case, the phone sent the uh, the authorization username and password. Sends the same register message again, but this time it has the register username and password. Um, it did not have that in the first message that it sent. It had its contact information, but it did not have the username and password. Okay, so there's a username, uh, which is the uh, local extension 101. And then there's an encrypted password. And because that username password was correct, the system responds with a SIP 200 OK message. Okay, so there's only four messages that have to go back and forth um, for a device to successfully register to the system. And you notice that when we send back the uh, 200 OK, which confirmed the registration, we also set an expiration time. We said, okay, this uh, registration is good for the next hour, which is 3,600 seconds. At that point, the phone will be obligated to uh, re-register. All right, the only other thing that I'd like to, uh, to point out is that some of these devices that are failing to register, ordinarily they would get blocked. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, there's a mechanism at work or an application within the system, within the firewall. Okay, if I look at the filtering rules, and 
the application is called SIP IDS. This is Intrusion Detection System. So what it's doing is it's actively watching for any failed registration attempts. So if a device tries to register to the system and it fails after three uh, after three unsuccessful registration attempts, three or four, it will um, in a very short period of time. What we're going to do is we're going to block that IP address. Okay, we, we're not going to allow that uh, user to or device to keep keep pounding away at the system and requesting to register. So what we would do is we're going to block that IP address. Now this is important to note because we're going to block that IP regardless of whether it's on the LAN or externally out coming from the internet. Okay, and once that IP gets blocked, we're not going to respond to that device anymore. Okay, so that's important to note. So if you're trying to configure a phone, as I've got several here that I'm configuring, and some of them are failing to register, these devices would get blocked. If I looked at my uh, list of uh, blocked IPs, I would find that list that that would uh, IPs uh, local IPs of those phones would be added in that list. Those phones would never work. All right, so it's important to note that if you have problems, make sure to check your uh, fire filtering rules. Make sure that IP is not added. There's also an exceptions list in here. You can go to SIP IDS exceptions. And you can see that I've added uh, the local subnet 172.30.0.0. slash 24. I've added that uh, subnet in there so it's not going to block those IPs that are continuing to fail uh, registrations. All right, so it's important to note. It's easy to check. You could go to your filtering rules, go to your blocked IPs. And <clears throat> you can see all these IPs are IPs that the system has blocked. Um, going back, this dates back to February of last year. Okay, and um, this was a user that was trying to register to the system, and we uh, we blocked that IP. So this is a security mechanism that we've added to the system, and um, one of many uh, security enhancements. And one of the reasons why a lot of people will buy the Epigee product is because of the uh, a lot of the enhancements that we have added. All right, so once that IP is blocked, we're gonna, not going to respond to it. You can see the list is quite long. Um, last IP address that was added in here, in here was uh, two days ago, uh, June 17th. Here's a, uh, an IP that was added. But you would see the local IP address added in here, and uh, what you'd need to do is just select it and remove it and delete it. Okay, and, and that would allow the device to continue to register. All right, with that in mind, that uh, that's concludes the session for today. I appreciate everyone's uh, participation. And um, let's uh, let me just put out my contact information here once again okay and um, let's see from the current slide all right here's my contact information if you have any suggestions on any topics that you'd like to see covered going forward uh, be sure to let me know um, if you uh, I'm going to uh, give you the opportunity um, if you have any questions now we can go ahead and uh, we can field those uh, those questions. All right. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, your time. I thank you for joining and, uh, we'll see you next week. Um, when we have uh, session two for, uh, configuring the IP phones. Thank you and have a great day.